to the whole host of questions is the issue of forum. In what forum, national or international, um, federal or military, all of those questions uh, we will get right into um, without delay. And the, um, the, the questions and issues that then feed into the forum question uh, will also be examined in our discussions. What I'd like to do is have actually two rounds by the speakers, um, first to present their views and then very quickly to respond afterwards to their uh, colleagues on the panel before opening it up for general discussion. Our panelists for today, as you know, are, Steve, excuse me, are Mike Matheson and Pierre Prosper and Chris Greenwood. Um, we'll be hearing first from Michael Matheson, um, who was visiting professor of international law at the School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins, um, where he also recently served as acting director of the International Law Program. He continues serving as a consultant and counsel to the U.S. Department of State and as an international law consultant and counsel in international tribunals. Previous to that, he served for over 28 years in the U.S. State Department, holding the post of principal deputy legal advisor in 1990-2000 and acting as head of the legal office on numerous occasions. While at State, he led efforts to create the International Criminal Tribunals for the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda and the U.N. Compensation Commission war claims. Mr. Matheson headed the U.S. delegation to the U.N. negotiations on conventional weapons, including those on the U.N. landlines protocol. He's argued cases before international tribunals, including the law Lockerbie case against Libya in 1997 and the legality of the use of force case against Yugoslavia in 1999. He's received a number of professional honors, including the Presidential Distinguished Executive Award and the Secretary of State's Distinguished Service Award. He's a member of the Board of Editors of the AJIL and has published extensively in this field. Mr. Matheson. Well, thank you for that very kind introduction. And uh, good morning. I'm uh, very delighted to be here, even at this hour, to uh, take part in this uh, discussion of a very topical and important issue. I'd like to uh, address this topic this morning. Uh, from the point of view of the individuals who have been detained for uh, alleged involvement in the September 11 incidents uh, and in the fighting in Afghanistan. And I'd like to consider uh, the various options for prosecution, including the military commissions proposed by the administration, but also other options that also need to be considered. Uh, I think to start off with, we need to accept uh, that uh, the option of use of military commissions is, in fact, uh, a valid and legitimate option in various circumstances involving armed conflict. Uh, this has been confirmed both by U.S. and international practice, most prominently with respect to the trial of various Axis offenders uh, during and after World War II. Uh, I think military commissions are an acceptable means of trying uh, persons who may have committed offenses against the laws of war, and that would include, for example, the deliberate targeting of civilians. Uh, it would include abuse of prisoners. It would include the failure of combatants to distinguish themselves from the civilian population. So I think these are all valid uses of military commissions. Uh, and secondly, I think we need to acknowledge uh, the fact that there have been useful uh, evolution in the position of the administration since their uh, November uh, order on military commissions of last year. Uh, that order, of course, was a subject of considerable controversy and debate, uh, in part because uh, the order itself contained gaps and ambiguities and raised many questions, but I think we have to acknowledge the steps that have been taken since then by the administration to attempt to deal with these, some of these issues. Uh, for example, it's important that the administration has now accepted that the 1949 Geneva Conventions do apply to the conflict with the Taliban in Afghanistan. Uh, although the administration position is that Taliban fighters are not entitled to POW status. Uh, I think it's important that the administration has elaborated the procedures for the military commissions, uh, most recently in an order issued on uh, March 21, uh, which includes, among other things, a provision for a regular review panel for the review of findings and sentences by the commissions. It includes uh, some helpful material on the right of defendants to choose their own counsel, uh, it includes a requirement that the presiding officer of these commissions be qualified judge advocates, and all of these things are very helpful. 
Uh, the administration has also recognized, I think, that military commissions are not necessarily the exclusive venue for trial of these various categories of offenders. Uh, we've seen this already in certain indictments in federal court sought by the administration. And I think the administration has also recognized the possibility of trial in other jurisdictions. The administration has also worked on a practical level with the International Red Cross with respect to the terms of detention of persons in Guantanamo. And although there are still differences in principle, I think a lot of these practical issues are being worked out in a satisfactory way. Having said all that, I think it's still the case that the use of military commissions, while a valid option, uh, do present real disadvantages in various kinds of circumstances. And therefore, it's very important for us to look at the alternative options for trial and to see how the advantages and disadvantages of those options compare with military commissions. Uh, one obvious alternative is the use of U.S. civilian courts. U.S. federal courts uh, for prosecution of offenses, either September 11 or other offenses against U.S. nationals. And here, of course, as you may be well aware, uh, U.S. legislation does provide for federal court jurisdiction over a number of the offenses that have allegedly been committed in these cases. Uh, one example is the indictment of uh, Musawi, uh, who was charged with a violation of various federal anti-terrorism statutes in connection with the September 11 event. Uh, as well as conspiracy to murder U.S. nationals. Then there's John Walker Lind, uh, who of course was involved in fighting in Afghanistan, and who has been indicted in uh, federal court with uh, conspiring to murder U.S. nationals, as well as providing support to foreign terrorist organizations, and engaging in prohibited transactions with the Taliban. All of these are federal statutory offenses. Now, in comparing this with the jurisdiction of military commissions, we don't yet really know exactly what the scope of jurisdiction of those commissions will be in terms of different offenses. Uh, the President's order of November 13 uh, simply provided in a general way that commissions would have jurisdiction over any and all offenses triable by military commission. And that hasn't yet been elaborated very much. Traditionally, these commissions have been used uh, to deal with offenses against the law of armed conflict, sabotage, espionage, hostile acts by unlawful combatants, violations of the rules of warfare. Um, but typically they have not had the broader range of jurisdiction that exists under these various federal statutes. And if that turns out to be the case, that military commissions don't have the same scope of jurisdiction as U.S. federal courts would have, then it may be that federal prosecutors would be under a disadvantage proceeding in military commissions as opposed to proceeding in the U.S. federal court, uh, both in terms of uh, securing convictions and in terms of uh, convincing defendants to cooperate. Uh, it may very well be that proving some of these uh, offenses under U.S. statutes will be a lot easier than trying to prove that September 11 was an armed attack and that persons involved in September 11 uh, had committed violations of the rules of warfare. So from the prosecutor's point of view, it might very well be to his advantage to be proceeding in federal court uh, rather than in uh, military commissions. I think there are also international considerations which may favor civilian over military trial in various different situations. I suspect that the prosecution of a defendant in open court in U.S. federal court uh, is likely to be more favorably received in many states than prosecution in military commissions. And in some cases, where we are seeking the cooperation of these states in prosecuting the war against terrorism, or where we're seeking extradition of individuals, uh, this may be an important factor. Uh, you'll note, for example, that uh, Mossawi was a French national, and that may have had something to do with the decision. Now, the administration may uh, point out that uh, military commissions offer an advantage as opposed to federal courts in terms of providing a more secure and an expeditious uh, forum. Uh, and there is something to that, but I think the fact that uh, indictments have been sought in the, the Musawi and Walker Lynn cases uh, show that these risks are judged to be uh, manageable in appropriate cases, and that there are procedures in federal court that can handle such risks. Therefore, I think there may very well be many cases in which it would be to our advantage to prosecute individuals in federal court rather than in military commission. And among these advantages are 
greater chance for effective prosecution and a greater chance for cooperation from other countries, uh, both in the war against terrorism and in specific prosecution cases. Now, another possible option, of course, is the trial of these individuals in foreign courts for violations of foreign law. There are, in fact, a wide variety of crimes in various foreign jurisdictions uh, which would not fall within the jurisdiction either of U.S. civilian courts or of U.S. military commissions. Uh, for example, uh, if there were al-Qaeda operatives in a third country, uh, no doubt they would have violated various uh, laws of that foreign jurisdiction, which might range all the way from immigration violations to forgery of official documents to unlawful financial transactions, illegally acquired weapons, and so on and so on. And in addition, uh, there may be third country nationals who have been taken into custody in Afghanistan who undoubtedly would have violated a variety of Afghan laws, as well as the, the laws of their own nationality. Uh, these various violations, again, may be much easier to prove as a practical matter than the proving violations of the law of armed conflict, for example, in the context of September 11th. Uh, equally important, foreign governments may find it a lot easier politically to prosecute these individuals themselves rather than to uh, surrender them to the United States for trial and military commissions. Uh, a particular problem here uh, is the question of the death penalty, where a number of foreign jurisdictions will not uh, extradite to the United States without some kind of renunciation of the possibility of the imposition of the death penalty by U.S. authorities. In addition, I think uh, foreign trials may have an advantage in the sense that uh, they would reduce the uh, political impression that the war against terror is a unilateral U.S. campaign uh, and would show a visible cooperation by other countries uh, which would strengthen the overall campaign in the political sense. So I think there may very well be many cases in which it would be preferable to seek or to accept trial by foreign jurisdictions uh, for individuals rather than insist on their extradition to the United States for trial by military commissions. Now, the same may be true with respect to Afghanistan in the sense that, uh, as I mentioned, uh, there will be a lot of individuals in custody who will have violated Afghan law. Uh, the problem here, obviously, is that there is very little uh, in the way of a, a surviving Afghan judicial system uh, in, in light of the uh, devastating uh, events of the past 20 years. Uh, and any uh, option for prosecution by Afghan authorities would, of course, depend upon uh, efforts to resurrect the, the judicial system in Afghanistan. But this should be a priority of the international community, as it has been in the case of Bosnia and Kosovo and East Timor and other places. Uh, and so if uh, such a system can be resurrected, that is another option. Now, with respect to trial in foreign countries, uh, the United States would presumably always want to have some kind of reasonable assurance of effective prosecution, a willingness to impose serious penalties, and also a willingness to observe fair procedures uh, for the trial of the defendants. Now, another theoretical option would be trial by international tribunals. And I think uh, the other members of the panel are going to be talking about this in, in greater length. So I'll be uh, brief. Uh, this is a hypothetical possibility. The International Criminal Court, which is just coming into existence, would not have jurisdiction over these various offenses for different reasons, including the fact that the International Criminal Court only has prospective jurisdiction, and also that it, uh, by its own rules, defers to national prosecutions where they're available. Uh, on the other hand, it would be hypothetically possible for the Security Council to create a new ad hoc criminal tribunal, uh, or to amend the uh, statute of one of the existing tribunals to include jurisdiction over these crimes. And as a purely legal matter, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, however, uh, my judgment would be that the council is unlikely to be willing to do so. Uh, it already suffers from the well-known tribunal fatigue, uh, and I think it would be unlikely to wish to incur the political responsibility and the financial cost of creating new tribunals for this purpose when there are so many national prosecution uh, options available. Uh, I think the general attitude which I would share is that international prosecution should be reserved for situations where national prosecution is not available or where national prosecution would cause some kind of threat to peace, which the 
Security Council had a reason to avoid. All of this suggests to me that the use of military commissions can be a viable and appropriate option in particular cases, in some circumstances. I think perhaps the best example of that would be a situation where defendant had committed violations of the law of war on the battlefield in Afghanistan, uh, but was not, uh, had not been so involved in September 11 that he could be convicted for offenses in federal court. I think for persons who can be proved to have been involved in September 11, I suspect that trial in U.S. federal court will prove to be a better option, uh, both in terms of giving prosecutors a wider range of offenses to prosecute, uh, and in terms of better securing cooperation by foreign governments. Uh, with respect to uh, defendants who can't be proved to have committed specific violations of the laws of war or to have been involved in September 11, I suspect the best option will be trial in foreign courts for various violations of foreign law. Uh, the main point is that these decisions should be taken on a pragmatic basis, uh, not on an ideological or reflexive basis. They should be taken with due consideration for the interests of the United States in maintaining widest possible support uh, for the U.S. campaign against terrorism. Uh, within that context, military commissions may have a role and a use, uh, but I think it's very important that these other options be given full consideration in every case and used where appropriate. I think I will stop at that and I will look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will continue on now um, hearing remarks from Ambassador Pierre Richard Prosper. Ambassador Prosper is U.S. Ambassador at Large for War Crimes Issues. Um, in this position, he advises the Secretary of State directly on U.S. efforts to address serious violations of international humanitarian law, including genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. In um, this capacity, he also coordinates the U.S. support for the international criminal tribunals for former Yugoslavia and Rwanda, and assists in the design and creation of other courts and judicial mechanisms to bring to justice offenders um, in this area. From 1999 to 2001, Ambassador Prosper served as Special Counsel and Policy Advisor to the previous and first Ambassador at Large for War Crimes Issues. Ambassador Prosper was detailed to the State Department from the U.S. Department of Justice, where he served starting in 1999 as a Special Assistant to the Assistant Attorney General for the Criminal Division. During 1996 to late 98, Ambassador Prosper served as a War Crimes Prosecutor for the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. As lead trial attorney there, he successfully prosecuted the well-known Akiyezu case and achieved the first conviction for genocide under the 48 Convention and, and also the first case before the Rwanda Tribunal in its entirety. Before 90, between 94 and 96, Ambassador Prosper was an assistant U.S. attorney for the Central District of California in Los Angeles prior to that was Deputy District Attorney for L.A. County. Thanks very much, Ambassador Prosper. Good morning, thank you, ma'am. I have to say it's a pleasure for me to, to be here today to, uh, to speak before this group on these issues of prosecuting terrorists. Uh, it's also a pleasure to be here with this uh, distinguished panel. I think that today we'll be able to get an overview of some of the possibilities and the complexities surrounding this issue of, of prosecuting terrorists. I think it is fair to say and it is obvious to say that this is an important issue and that, that is extremely relevant particularly based on the events of September 11. My focus will be, well, I'm tempted to respond to the last speaker, will be more on what is the appropriate, I guess, forum in a sense of whether or not there should be some sort of an international body to prosecute terrorists, or should it be done at the 
the state level. But I guess in order to get a, an appreciation of, of the forum and the problem that exists, it'd be helpful to recap the threat and the, uh, the magnitude of the crimes that have occurred. When we look at the perpetrators, I think it is safe to say that the United States and the world is facing an evil that is obviously unprecedented, but one that is being waged by a private organization that has a global reach. Just in the past 15 years, terrorism has expanded from being isolated acts of bombing, suicide bombers, to being these organized events as we saw on September 11th. The lethality and sophistication of the networks has grown. The threat against the United States has grown. If we look at the statistics for the year 2000, 47% of the attacks, terrorist attacks that occurred, were anti-American. These independent groups that are well organized at times receive state backing and sanctuary. They attack innocent civilians and non-military structures in order to advance their cause. It is clear that these criminals are not ordinary criminals and their crimes are not ordinary crimes. The range of activity reaches and crosses all ethnical, racial, and religious lines. The reality is, is that terrorists, terrorists attack innocent civilians with equal indifference. Whether they are a closely knit group or loosely acquainted, these groups obviously undermine state, regional, and global stability. But that is not to say that they exist or they are part of a culture of impunity, because impunity for terrorism does not exist. I don't think we'll find a single state that will say that they officially sponsor terrorism. And because of their acts, we all agree that they must be constrained, detained, and prosecuted. Because of the enormity of the challenge and the scope of their reach, it is clear that there is a responsibility to prosecute these individuals or these groups, and this responsibility is shared throughout the international community. It is not one that can actually be delegated to an international body or abandoned to a, a neighbor state. After September 11th, Fairly shortly after September 11th, the conversation came up as to how are we going to prosecute these people and in what form should it be. I can tell you, within probably two weeks, there were immediate calls for the creation of an international tribunal to prosecute the perpetrators. The calls were loud. When we talked about possibly doing things domestically, there was a bit of an outcry saying it's better to do it in an international forum out of fairness and partiality or whatever the rationale that was being advanced. I think what the events of September 11th did in this particular regard in dealing with accountability for war crimes and terrorism is that it revealed a split view on accountability and the rationale of what the true purpose is or should be behind the creation of international tribunals. There are some who feel that international tribunals are essentially relevant and appropriate in all instances where the crimes reach such a scale that it shocks all of our conscience. An opposing view is that international mechanisms are reserved for those instances where a state is unable to prosecute based on a dysfunctional judiciary or failed state, or the state is truly, politically, unwilling to do so. This begs the question, obviously, of which view is correct. I think in order to answer this question, it would be helpful to look at the historical development of international tribunals to understand the rationale behind it, and, and, and essentially also to understand where, what is the future, which way we are going. <coughs> 
in doing so, I think it's good to look at the, at the perpetrators. International tribunals, and if we look back to the, uh, the Nuremberg precedent in the beginning there, historically arose in the context of systematic crimes committed under the authority of state officials. It was these same state officials who obviously were responsible for enforcing the rule of law within their society and borders, yet they were the ones responsible for destroying the rule of law within the territory that they controlled. The criminals, these war criminals, hid behind the principle of sovereignty and power in order to prevent the prosecution by other states and within their territory. The international community obviously understood this and realized, particularly at that time, that a true accountability would not be achieved without international involvement. Recognizing the not only the magnitude of the offenses in World War II, but the, uh, the classification of the perpetrators, <clears throat> a decision was made to establish, or by the Allied powers, to establish a strategy for the prosecution of the war criminals. <clears throat> the strategy was essentially twofold. One, for those major leaders whose reach had no true geographic limitation and localization, a decision was made to establish an international military tribunal because truly there was no authority and it was the only way that the leaders would truly be, be prosecuted. It was also decided that for the mid or lower level people in the Moscow de Declaration, that it would be best to send the German officers back to the countries in which their abdominal deeds were done in order to, that they did be judged and punished in these liberated countries. So what we saw was obviously an international tribunal at the top. We then saw military commissions at a mid-level that were established in the occupied portions of Germany. And then there was a decision to send the other cases back to the states so that the states could be able to prosecute the perpetrators for the offenses that they committed. Now this approach of, of attempting to achieve justice in areas where there was no authority to administer justice was obviously followed in the Yugoslavia context in the creation of the ICTY because there again we were in a situation based on the Milosevic regime where accountability would not be achieved because there was no authority to truly administer the accountability for the war crimes and justice was not possible. In the Rwanda context, it was a different situation where accountability would not be achieved because we're in a situation of a, a failed state, a dysfunctional state that was truly destroyed as a result of the genocide in 1994. It was a situation where the, the majority of the lawyers were killed or fled, the facilities were destroyed, the infrastructure was non-existent. <coughs> Additionally, it was a context where the crimes were so great, the perpetrators were truly spread throughout the globe, and international enforcement power was needed in order to bring them back to gain custody over these individuals. When we look at the, event, the efforts today to create an international criminal tribunal, it is essentially being, the ideas being advanced is under with this philosophy in mind, where there's absolutely no possible way of achieving accountability, and that, or it could be used in a situation where there's a dysfunctional state. But when we look at terrorism, neither of these problems exist. Because even if we had an ICC, an ICC could prosecute terrorism, it is not the appropriate forum. An international tribunal is not the appropriate forum for prosecution of terrorists. Unlike conventional war crimes violations, the terrorists obviously are not state actors. They do not carry a role, they do not govern, and they do not have the responsibilities associated with governing, and that is administering the rule of law. They are essentially outlaws to the world and under the jurisdiction of all sovereign 
states for their particular acts. They are not in a position to block or to prevent accountability mechanisms from, from being created and responding to their deeds. While they may at times receive safe harbor, safe pass, passage and protection from sympathetic states and leaders, there will always be a state that it has proper jurisdiction to prosecute and is willing to prosecute terrorists. Traditional grounds for domestic jurisdiction based on territoriality, treaty obligations, or the nationality of the victims or perpetrators are sufficient to support national prosecutions for, for terrorists. In short, for every terrorist crime that is committed, there will always be one or more sovereign state that, is, that has the will, the jurisdiction, and the ability to prosecute terrorists. This is all recognized in all the multilateral treaties that have been agreed to relating to terrorism. Most of these treaties call for the recognition of the crimes, cooperation, and extradition of suspects. The Hague Hijacking Convention calls for the extradition of terrorists or that the cases be submitted to competent authorities for the purpose of prosecution and proceedings in accordance with domestic legislation. The Convention for the Suppression of Financing of Terrorism also calls for, for extradition or submission to competent authorities for prosecution. Again, these multi multilateral treaties recognize that the best way to deal with terrorism is through domestic institutions. In the present circumstances, we do know, obviously, that the acts of Al-Qaeda reach across borders there are many states that have an interest to prosecute these individuals. With these new challenges, what we did is create an international coalition to combat these terrorists. The idea based on the Security Council Resolution 1373 and our diplomacy was essentially to create a coalition that would deny safe haven, improve efforts to restrict financial support for terrorists, and pursue prosecution for terrorists for their activities. In fact, the best way to look at it is a coalition that was built asking each state to use its unilateral authority and powers to prosecute terrorists, or to go after terrorists. And when we look at it in this regard, it is clear that the reach of the law is a broader reach than that one that would be provided by an international tribunal. Each state can prosecute terrorists for acts that occur obviously within their country or against their victim. Each state can take actions to restrict the financial support of terrorists, particularly based on the Security Council Chapter 7 resolution. Each state should have the willingness to prosecute terrorists because no terrorist, again, will admit that they are a, uh, a sponsor of terrorism or they are a terrorist society. And if there is a particular state that is sponsoring terrorism, the coalition can come together, apply the pressure, and create the political will to take action. If we look at what has been occurring in the past several months, we see this coalition working. We hear of apprehensions that are taking place in Europe. We hear of the arrests in Pakistan. We hear, obviously, we're working closely in Afghanistan. You see that there are activities in the, in the Philippines. There's activities in other parts and on the African continent. It is each state exercising its unilateral power in conjunction with the international community to combat these crimes. If we were to create an international tribunal, we would be in a situation where the states would be abdicating their responsibility and waiting for an international tribunal to do the job. Everyone would be pointing the finger of responsibility. The reach would be limited. So in prosecuting terrorists, in combating terrorism, 
the argument should be that the appropriate way is through domestic processes, domestic efforts, domestic legislation, through the efforts of the Security Council and enforcement of the Security Council. And these are my, my basic remarks on this. Uh, I look forward to the second round when we can talk about some of the details in, this, in the unilateral application of our international obligations and talk about the, the military commissions and some of the efforts and rationale behind that and other questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Prosper. And now for our final first uh, round of presentations, we have Professor Christopher Greenwood. Professor Greenwood read law at Magdalen College, Cambridge, where he obtained his MA and LLB. Since April of 96, he's been professor, professor of international law at the London School of Economics. Before that, he was a fellow and tutor of Magdalen College and university lecturer in law. He's joint editor of the International Law Reports and the Kuwait Crisis, Basic Documents, and he's published a number of articles and pamphlets on different aspects of both international and European community law. He's a member of the editorial committee of the British Yearbook of International Law, and is currently completing The Modern Law of Armed Conflict, which is soon to be published by Oxford University Press. Professor Green was called to the bar by the Middle Temple in 1978, and has practiced as a barrister since 1985. He's appeared as counsel in a number of cases in the International Court of Justice as well as before English courts, um, before the ICJ cases including the Lockerbie case and the case of the use of force in Kosovo, and before English courts in cases including the Pinochet extradition case. He was appointed Queen's Counsel in 1999. Professor Greenwood has been a visiting professor at universities here in the States, as well as Director of Studies and Lecturer at the Academy of International Law at the Hague. He lectures regularly at the Royal College of Defense Studies and at staff colleges in the UK and elsewhere. Thanks for being with us, Professor Greenwood. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. Um, yes, Scott Sullivan, in his opening remarks, said that uh, the fact that I was here this morning didn't mean that you'd had too much wine last night. Uh, it may, of course, mean that I had too much wine last night when I offered to take this on. I want to talk a little bit about the international dimensions involved in the prosecution of terrorists. Because, as both the previous speakers have already noted, whether one thinks the appropriate forum for trying a terrorist is a domestic court or an international tribunal, irrespective of that, the prosecution of terrorists requires very extensive international cooperation. It's not something which can simply be dealt with unilaterally by one state. The nature of modern terrorism is that it cuts across her frontiers, and it therefore requires a degree of multinational effort. And on that, let me at the outset make something of a plea to those of you who feel, understandably, that in the light of what happened on the 11th of September, America has a special interest in this. Please remember that there are many other states around the world that have suffered the effects of terrorism to at least as great an extent for many, many years indeed. If one just takes the terrorist patch that I have on my, my backyard, over the course of the troubles in Northern Ireland, more than 3,000 people have lost their lives as a result of terrorist activity. Now that is out of a population of one and a half million. To gross that up, to give you an equivalent number for the population of the United States, it would be as if half a million people in this country had been killed as a result of terrorist activity. And there are plenty of other countries, for example, one thinks of what Ambassador Farmi said about Egypt yesterday at lunchtime. There are plenty of other countries that have had to confront this problem of how to bring terrorists to justice for many, many years. Whatever system is set up to address the aftermath of the 11th of September, be it an international tribunal or military commissions, you cannot divorce the trial of Al-Qaeda terrorists from the question of bringing other types of terrorists to justice. It cannot be seen that the United States and its allies are interested only in those who kill our people. 
necessarily whatever is done about this incident, this atrocity, is going to have repercussions for the approach to terrorism on a much broader basis. Now, with that in mind, let me also say, by way of a threshold remark, and I'm afraid this may disappoint you, Madam Chair, uh, I'm not going to stand here and make the case for international tribunals at great length. I've always been a little skeptical about international criminal tribunals. There is, I'm afraid, from time to time, an element of job creation for international lawyers in some of the proposals that are put forward. Um, now, well, you might well think that as I'm an international lawyer who makes my living out of this, I shouldn't try and break the rice bowl of my colleagues. But it doesn't seem to me that providing career opportunities for myself and my colleagues is necessarily a very high priority when looking at how to address the prosecution of terrorism. Whatever happens, the vast majority of terrorist trials are going to take place in national courts, and in my opinion, the appropriate forum for trying those who perpetrated the World Trade Center and Pentagon atrocities is a United States court, either federal or state, in this country. Now, that said, one has, I think, also to keep in mind that this country has a judicial system of which it can rightly be proud. There are plenty of states around the world that don't. And that if we are going to emphasize the importance of bringing people to trial in national tribunals, that may well require very considerable financial assistance to some countries to get their criminal justice systems off the ground. With no disrespect, Mr. Ambassador, to the work that you and your colleagues at the Rwanda Tribunal did in cases like Akayezi, it is, I think, important to keep in mind that there will be several hundred people tried for offenses arising out of the genocide in Rwanda in the courts of Rwanda for every one that stands trial before the ICTR. And yet I strongly suspect that the amount of resources that the international community has put into reconstructing the judicial system of Rwanda will look extremely small when set against the budget of the ICTR over the last five years. It's no good saying it's the duty of Afghanistan to bring those who commit terrorist offences to trial before their courts if there are no courts, no law reports, no police force, no bailiffs, and no jails that any of us would consider sending a dog to, let alone a human being. If we're going to call upon states to exercise their responsibilities here, they have to have the resources with which to exercise them. Now with those threshold remarks in mind, let me turn to the two issues which I want to focus on today. The first is that trial before national courts will require very considerable transnational cooperation between states. And in particular, that is going to require extensive cooperation in respect of extradition. If a Saudi national operating from a base in Afghanistan, but temporarily occupying a flat in Paris, drawing funds from an account in Switzerland, which he pays through a Cayman Islands bank, but in turn is that the money is then laundered through the Bahamas, to somebody in New York who gives the money to an illegal immigrant who's entered the United States out of Mexico, who then perpetrates a terrorist offense, you can see very clearly that more than one country is going to be involved. I think it's important to face up to the fact that there are real difficulties about the whole system of extradition and mutual cooperation in criminal matters. Difficulties which we shouldn't underestimate. In effect, None of us really trusts other countries' criminal systems to do the job as well as we can do it ourselves. Good heavens, places like Portugal don't even have juries. How outrageous. Were you aware that in Austria, the prosecuting counsel will begin by telling the court a list of the accused's previous convictions? Because there couldn't possibly be any evidence more appropriate for the court to hear than that. Do you realize that the way in which prosecutors in the United States come straight outside and say on the courthouse steps that they're going to call for this, that, and the other, and that's only at the remand hearing or the grand jury hearing, that that would be a criminal offense in the United Kingdom for which the prosecutor could expect to serve several years in jail for contempt of court? Our criminal justice systems are very different. What is admissible evidence in one country wouldn't even be considered as possible evidence in another. And that makes the extradition system creak at the seams. 
Add to that a level of mutual distrust, different political cultures over the years, and you have a system that really barely deserves the name of a system at all. One thinks, for example, of the number of cases in which judges in this country declined to extradite people on terrorist charges to the United Kingdom until the change in the extradition treaty in 1986. Now, we have moved on a very long way since those days. The idea that the political offender exception, drawn up in the 19th century to protect those who took up arms against an oppressive government, can be used today as a shield by those who perpetrate acts of terrorism, that has largely been set to one side. We have expedited extradition arrangements in Europe through the new arrest warrant that Christoph Hugson was talking about yesterday. But don't underestimate the practical difficulty that remains of securing extradition between two countries where, in one case, a prima facie case is required as a basis for extradition, and another state where the concept of a prima facie case means nothing whatever. Try explaining to an Italian lawyer what we mean in Britain by a prima facie case, and the eyes will glaze over very quickly indeed. I'll give you another illustration of some of the practical problems that can arise. The House of Lords in Britain heard an appeal at the end of last year by Mr. al Fawaz and another defendant who were wanted by the United States on charges in connection with the Kenya and Tanzania embassy bombings. Now, you would have thought that this would be a very straightforward case, apart from the usual difficulties about evidence. But the problem is, of course, that the crimes weren't committed in the United States and that Alpha Waz's connection with the US was extremely light. Now, that shouldn't matter. It seems to me to be clear beyond doubt that under modern international law, the United States has jurisdiction to try somebody who perpetrates an attack upon a US embassy in a foreign country. Yet, unfortunately, the extradition treaty between the two countries was not amended to take account of that change. And it required a very imaginative judgment on the part of their lordships to read the concept of jurisdiction from an essentially 19th century treaty as covering concepts of jurisdiction as they exist today. And it required them to disregard precedents on both sides of the Atlantic about the interpretation of the treaty at an earlier age. Now, the end result in the Alpha Waz case is an entirely desirable one. The court was able to find that the difficulties over jurisdiction could be surmounted. But if that type of problem can arise at all between two countries that are the closest of allies, have identical interests on this issue of international terrorism, and legal systems which are probably closer to one another than either is to almost any other country in the world, you can imagine the difficulty over extraditing somebody from Thailand to stand trial in Pakistan, or from Saudi Arabia to stand trial somewhere in Africa. Another difficulty about multinational cooperation in this area, and it's one that has to be faced up to, is the different views on the two sides of the Atlantic about the death penalty. And John Ashcroft, the Attorney General here, made the comment somewhat acerbically on television that the crimes on the 11th of September had happened in America, they were governed by American law, and American law should take its course. And if the United States people want to have the death penalty, then they're free to do so. I agree with everything that he said in that respect. While I am myself opposed to the death penalty, I wouldn't seek to inflict my views on that on the electorate of another country. But please understand that the same must apply in reverse. The European states also have constitutional obligations. We're all parties to the European Convention on Human Rights, and under the terms of that convention, and its Protocol 6, we cannot extradite somebody to a country where they face being executed. It's as simple as that. It's a constitutional limitation for us, as demanding as the US Constitution is for the executive in this country. And therefore, extradition is out of the question without an undertaking that the death penalty will not be sought by the prosecutor and will not be carried out. Incidentally, Ambassador Farmi also raised this point yesterday. The answer, and I should perhaps have asked him about it at lunch, is that Egypt could have given a similar undertaking in respect of somebody that it wanted extradited. 
the, Euro the UK and other European states doesn't, do not refuse to extradite somebody to countries that have the death penalty, which is the way the ambassador put it. We will simply not extradite and cannot extradite where the individual defendant has a, is at serious risk of being executed in that particular case. And there's also, I think, it has to be faced a question mark in many European lawyers' minds about the proposed military commissions. Lord Scott, one of the law lords in the um, al Fawaz case, raised the question and dropped a very broad hint that if al Fawaz had faced trial before the military commission, he would have wanted to look much more closely at whether that military commission would meet the standards of a fair trial as far as UK and European law were concerned. Now, I don't think for a minute that it isn't possible to overcome that difficulty, but let us be quite clear that the difficulty is there. So let me turn from that to the question of whether an international tribunal might be a substitute. Let me say, perhaps a little unfashionably uh, in the United States, I'm delighted that the International Criminal Court has now achieved its 60 ratifications and that the court will come into being in 60 days' time. It's quite right, as Mr. Matheson pointed out, that even if it had been in existence a year ago, uh, it would have been extremely difficult to bring the World Trade Center case in front of it. Not, I think, impossible. I think you could have made a very powerful case for saying that the attack on the World Trade Center, perhaps not the one on the Pentagon, but certainly the attack on the World Trade Center, was a crime against humanity, and therefore fell within the scope of the ICC's jurisdiction. But it wouldn't be possible for the ICC to take jurisdiction retrospectively. In my opinion, even with a Security Council with authorization to do so, that would present insuperable obstacles. And also, the ICC was only ever intended to have jurisdiction in cases where national courts could not or would not exercise it. Which leaves the possibility of a tribunal created by the Security Council. Now, I agree entirely with the other two speakers that, first of all, that is a political pipe dream. It isn't going to happen. The Council is not going to create a special tribunal to try the Al Qaeda people. Except, perhaps, in one scenario that I'll come to in a moment. Secondly, I agree that it isn't necessary. I'm not one of those who thinks that the US courts cannot do this job perfectly effectively. I've always taken the view that the appropriate forum is here. But let me just play devil's advocate for a minute and set out for you a few of the advantages of an international tribunal that it's perhaps easy to overlook. The obvious one, and it's been touched on already, is that it gives a greater appearance of fairness. It's not enough that a trial is fair, it has to be seen to be fair. Now, I think, frankly, one can overdo that. Slobodan Milosevic's supporters will not think that the ICTY is fair. In fact, they say every day that it's extremely unfair. I'm rather flattered, actually, that they accuse the United Kingdom of being responsible for all this. It's a British plot. It's rather nice, as the old, retired Satan, to find that occasionally we still get the blame for something. Um, the, the US administration's let's face it, have rather hogged the center stage of guilt in the eyes of people like Milosevic over the years. And it's nice to think occasionally that the British are worth blaming for something as well. But nevertheless, those who question the fairness of US courts and US law to deal with something as shocking as the 11th of September might, in some cases, be more attractive by an international option. A second advantage, which hasn't been mentioned so far, is that an international tribunal would try a terrorist for a crime under international law. It would be a case of applying a global standard, and a standard that was openly declared to be global, rather than applying the standards that have emerged from a single national legal system. That might have its advantages too. There would be no question of a death sentence in an international tribunal. That would make it acceptable to countries that are opposed to the death penalty. And lastly, and this is perhaps a rather difficult one, an international tribunal, rather than a common law style of court, would give you a reasoned judgment. Now, I know that the old maxim is never give your reasons, because even if the result is right, the reasons are always open to criticism. But we've just had the experience in the UK 
at the trial before a special Scottish court sitting in the Netherlands of the two men accused of the Lockerbie bomb, one of whom was convicted, the other acquitted. And in an 80-page judgment, the three judges set out their analysis of the evidence and their reasons for coming to the conclusion that they did. That may well be more convincing to the international public than a simple guilty or not guilty verdict of the kind to which we're used in the common law world. Now, all that said, I still don't find those reasons compelling. It seems to me that the priorities are these. First of all, that those who perpetrated the attacks on the 11th of September must be brought to trial. And if the only way of bringing them to trial is an international tribunal, then I'd go for an international tribunal. And I rather think in the end, so would everybody else. Secondly, that the trial, wherever it takes place, should be an effective one. Thirdly, that it should be fair, and that it should be seen to be fair. And lastly, that it should have some effect in educating the public. Everyone who spoke at this conference has said quite rightly that what happened on the 11th of September was a terrible outrage, a terrorist crime. But that isn't going to be the view you'll hear if you wander around the streets of Cairo or Islamabad or Karachi. It's not what you're going to hear if you go through quite a lot of the Middle East. And one of the functions that a trial terrorist ought to serve, in my view, is to try and lay to rest any shadow of a justification with as broad a public as possible. We should make it clear to the world that what happened was a terrorist outrage and give no scope whatever for attempts to condone it afterwards. And a public hearing is going to do that far more effectively than any kind of trial behind closed doors. Thank you very much, Professor Greenwood. Before turning now to our second short round, I wanted to just um, elaborate a bit or, or comment on Professor Greenwood's last uh, point about the, the differences of views about the characterization of terrorist crimes. And, particular example, the crimes of September 11, um, and, the, the, and to bring it back, though, to the question of international tribunals, that is, when I, when I think about the, I, I don't happen to favor international tribunals, certainly as a first resort for these crimes, but when thinking about um, what the arguments for that would be, that is, what the arguments about international tribunal as the best and first approach, um, one, related precisely to the, to the question of the perception of the crimes themselves and the utilization of a trial um, as a way to achieve the, the condemnation and the um, unambiguous characterization of those acts as wrong. As you, you mentioned Cairo, I returned from a week in Cairo two days ago and was, was very much exposed to exactly what you're saying, the view that there, what we have here is really, to use now an American's term, a clash of civilizations. Um, that, that what's happening is very much to be interpreted um, differently uh, d depending on the uh, side of a, of a deep divide on which you stand. In that sense, if in fact what's happening um, is being perceived very differently and is being perceived as happen um, occurring in the light of some kind of a global rift with two sides lining up against each other, that poses an argument in favor of an international tribunal. Not only in favor of a fair trial perceived to be so, as you said, but doesn't it also pose an argument for an international court, the idea being that once a condemnation, a trial itself, a revelation of truth, and a condemnation in case of conviction emerges from an international tribunal, um, then it may be more difficult for individuals who might otherwise perceive a conviction um, in, in a national court as having been just one more blow, um, just one more type of attack and counterattack in this clash, um, wouldn't that be overcome somewhat by the use of an international tribunal? Again, in the, at the end of the day, I personally don't happen to line up um, with the view that international tribunals are the way to go, but I did want to, to throw that into the mix of considerations for our discussion about forum and the best possible approach. If there was some kind of
heavy state sponsorship of a terrorist campaign where it was necessary to apply the authority of the Security Council on the measures available to the Council to deal with that. Uh, or a case where there was some form of crisis or tension or even conflict between two states where national prosecutions would exacerbate that conflict and the Council may feel that an international trial would be better for the maintenance of peace. Uh, in fact, uh, there were heavy components of these uh, considerations about peace and security and the decisions of the Council to create tribunals for Yugoslavia and Rwanda, and that's appropriate. That's the Council's responsibility. So I think I would reserve the possibility, rather than categorically ruling out international trial, that there may be circumstances which would arise where an international trial would be a good option. It certainly is an available one. The other caveat is that there is, of course, a significant overlap between international terrorism and other forms of international crimes which are usually thought of as appropriate subjects for international trial, in particular war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. Uh, many uh, hypothetical acts of international terrorism would fall within those other categories as well. Uh, in fact, there has been an interesting debate about whether it's more proper to consider the September 11 attacks as crimes against humanity, or as international terrorism, or even as war crimes, by, and it may be that there are examples of all three. Um, all of this points, I think, to um, my underlying feeling about international prosecutions, which is that uh, there needs to be some affirmative reason uh, to have an international prosecution rather than relying upon national authorities. And uh, it requires an element of judgment by some uh, body with political authority and real power. Uh, in the case of the ad hoc tribunals, that was the Security Council. I don't frankly know how these judgments will be made in the case of the International Criminal Court, and I'll be very curious to see how this plays out. But it does seem to me that there, there will be need for real political and policy judgment in cases uh, about deciding whether international prosecution may be necessary in particular circumstances. Um, and the idea that an international tribunal would, uh, would create a perception of, of fairness, I think one thing that we can do is just look at the existing examples of the, the tribunals, particularly if we look at the, uh, the, the ICTY, a common, so in the back of the ICTY obviously was created within a security council and this uh, is a truly international mechanism with international backing. But if you walk the streets of Belgrade, or you walk in the Republic of Srpska, the perception is, is that it is a creation of the West. It is a Western entity, and it is not fair. I, I, I believe that the ICC will most likely suffer from the same perception. It may be not the entire West, it would be the, the EU. But people will say, particularly in the developing world, when the ICC begins to focus on those events, that it is a, a creation of the West, it is not fair. So there may not be that acceptance that, that justice is truly being being administered, it's more likely being imposed. Uh, but to a few quick comments on the military commission. Uh, we, in looking at the military commission, the first thing I want to say is that this is an option for the president. It's something that will provide the president flexibility when the time comes in making a decision as to who should be prosecuted within the uh, United States and within a particular forum. Uh, the fact, I would not read too much into the fact that you have the Mosawi and other cases, the Reed case that are currently in our federal system. There are a variety of reasons why they are in the federal system. And also, if a careful reading of the President's order of, of November will show that these cases can be removed and put into a military commission process. I, I, I wouldn't read, read too much into it as far as lessons learned. The primary reason that there are, uh, it was the option of military commission was created is uh, essentially, actually it's twofold. One is the nature of offenses. We made the determination that the events of September 11th were essentially war crimes, or violations of the laws and customs of war. We looked back historically at the Al-Qaeda organization and the threat 
and uh, that opposed the United States as well as the criminal conduct of the organization, went back to 1993, looked at the uh, World Trade Center bombing, looked at the, uh, the Al-Qaeda's link to uh, the attack of our service members in Somalia. We, we saw the Al-Qaeda was responsible for the bombings of the embassy in Nairobi and embassy in Dar es Salaam in 1998. We looked and saw that Al-Qaeda was responsible for the bombing of the coal. We saw a decade's worth of statement from bin Laden and his associates that they are at war against the United States and it's their job to kill American citizens. Uh, we obviously considered other threats that, uh, and attacks that were thwarted. We looked at the events of September 11th, the attack on the World Trade Center, the attack at the Pentagon, and the, uh, the attack on a plane in Pennsylvania. And the conclusion is that it is a war, it's an unconventional war that is being waged by unconventional means. And seeing that, we realize that we do have an option of a military commission and using it for violations of the laws of war. A decision was made to create the commission because we wanted the flexibility to be able to prosecute the cases, if necessary, outside of the United States, outside of Manhattan. A, a thought that we had was, do we really want to bring 300 Al-Qaeda members into southern Manhattan and, and burden the system, not only with the physical presence, but the threat that is imposed? We, we can imagine, you hear the stories today of what's going on in uh, Afghanistan, in Kandahar, Bahrain and uh, um, the, 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 the threats, the attacks against our, our service members over there who are guarding some of these people. We can imagine what it would pose on the, uh, the system in New York. The people, the court clerk, the bailiff, the court reporter, the people, the jurors, the people who did not sign up to be part of this. So there was, it was an option that was, that was created in order to address some of these, these security concerns. Uh, as was noted, the rules have come out, and I, it's clear now to the public that what we said all along is in fact what we, what we meant, that it will be a fair, full, and open process. There will be moments where the trial may be closed uh, for national security reasons, which is not unusual. We see this in the case of uh, Milosevic today, we see this in uh, cases of the ICTY and the ICTR. Uh, basically, this is a, an approach that the President has decided is necessary as an option. We'll see when and how it will be used in the, in the future. There's probably a, you know, a lot more we can, we, can, we can talk about here, particularly with detainees in Guantanamo and the, 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 I, I found the discussion on extradition is actually fascinating. Uh, you know, one thing, one position that we're in now with our detainees in Guantanamo is that we will be able to, to freely move them back if they have situations like the UK, for example, for, for adjudication and action without having to go through a overly complex or burdened extradition process because we're operating under a different set of laws, a different body of law. And my last point, just for, for clearer understanding, is that in this entire situation, I think it needs to be recognized that there are two bodies of law that are being, that are uh, applicable or relevant, let's put it that way. You have the laws of war, which deals with obviously not only the prosecution issues, but the detention issues, and the authority to detain people. And then we have the criminal law, which deals with obviously from the criminal realm with the prosecutions and different rights, the right to counsel and so on. Today we're still under the umbrella of, of the laws of war. But let me stop there and, uh, and pass the mic over. Thank you very much. Um, yes, let me say, repeat that I'm not making a case for having an international tribunal for these crimes. I think the one case where I would urge the creation of an international tribunal would be if that turned out to be the only way 
of bringing somebody like Bin Laden to trial. If, for example, Bin Laden turned up in a country that made it clear they would, they would not or could not send him for trial in any of the countries that wish to exercise jurisdiction, but would hand him over for trial before an international tribunal. I think there is then a, a good case for setting up a tribunal of that kind. But I quite accept the point that the ambassador has just made, that uh, the ICTY is seen as a creation of the West in uh, Yugoslavia. The ICC, I'm not so sure, is going to be seen in quite that light. I think that the coalition will put it together is rather broader. But uh, you've got a, a trade-off here. The ICTY may be seen as a creation of the West. The courts of the United States are undoubtedly a creation of the United States. And they are administering United States law, not international law. So in terms of persuading a wider public that these are crimes under international law, under global standards, then I think you do have a case of saying that an international tribunal would do that more effectively. But to my mind, that's not enough to overcome the practical difficulties and the sheer time scale problem of setting up a tribunal capable of dealing with terrorist trials of this kind, which would, for example, create security problems way in excess of anything that the ICTY or the ICTR has had to go. Can I just turn for a moment um, to the point that uh, the ambassador made at the end about uh, crimes under the laws of war? I, I have to say that I, I, I would not take that view myself. I have no doubt whatever that crimes committed on the battlefield in Afghanistan by Taliban and Al-Qaeda personnel are war crimes, may well be grave breaches of the Geneva Conventions in some circumstances. But I have some difficulty, I must confess, with the idea that there was already armed conflict sufficient to bring the law of war crimes into being before the 11th of September. And there are two reasons why I think that that needs to be looked at rather carefully. The first is an argument of law. An armed conflict with whom? What is there in customary international law which brings the law of war crimes into play in relation to a series of sporadic incidents, very well planned perhaps, but not connected up in the way that military operations normally are, between a state and a non-state actor. But the second is a more political point. Members of the IRA starved themselves to death in the 1980s in order to achieve almost exactly what we've just heard, the recognition that they were engaged in an armed conflict with the United Kingdom, and that if they were committing crimes, they were crimes of war. And if you accept that there was an armed conflict and that we're applying the laws of war here, I'd be very interested to hear what violation of the laws of war was committed by the attack on the USS Cole. Now, to my mind, the attack on the USS Cole is a straightforward case of murder. But to try and analyze it under the laws of war as a war crime, I'd have some problems with that. If there was an armed conflict between the United States and Al-Qaeda already, then the coal would appear to be a military target. The violation of international law would be a violation of the neutrality of Yemen. But I don't think that that would be sufficient to make it a war crime under international law, either customary or written. So I think that the administration could well be storing up very considerable difficulties for itself on like that. And I don't myself see any advantage of, in trying to squeeze, and it, it's, it's the fable of Cinderella's ugly sisters, they couldn't fit their shoes, in their, their feet into the glass slipper, no matter how they tried. I think you're trying to squeeze a foot that doesn't fit into a slipper which you may well break if you try and push too hard. Actually, if I may, just, just briefly uh, just respond. No, I, I think the, the, the issue runs deeper, and I think we really need to look at, at the the events in the law. Regarding whether or not there was an armed conflict, we simply need to look at, obviously, uh, not only the definitions that we have of hostilities that uh, we would argue are more than sporadic. They are, obviously, it's a well-organized campaign. It's just an unconventional war. But if you look at the, the response, the international response, which is also appropriate in making a determination as to whether there was an armed conflict on September 11th, we only need to look to NATO that, that invoked the, uh, the article of mutual defense, saying that the country has been attacked. This is an article, I believe, what, Article 5, that's 
reserved for cases of armed conflict. So you have NATO speaking out saying that that there's been an attack against the United States in the in the sense of a of a, of a war and armed conflict. You also have Australia and New Zealand that invoke similar mutual defense uh, provisions and our treaties with them. You look at the organization, organization of American states that also recognizes invoking the treaties. You have the, the UN Security Council, which said that the attacks are breached to peace and security, which is something that has also traditionally been reserved for, uh, for, for conflict environment. And then we looked at our own Congress that spoke out and gave the, the president the right to use force to respond to these these attacks. So if you look at it, you can see that it, it is obviously it's it's an armed conflict that has been waged against uh, the United States. The the question of the coal brings in another set of law that we need to to uh, to discuss. And here's what we're, we're doing: we're looking at this. We're we're not trying to stuff it into the shoe. We're looking at the law and giving it the appropriate application, looking at the spirit of the law, one thing that we can say is that it is an armed conflict being waged, a war being waged by Al-Qaeda. A war need not be waged by a state. We hear of non-state actors all the time waging war. Here we have a private organization that is able to, to create hostilities that reach the level of war. The issue here is whether they have a legal right to wage war. And the answer is no. This is why you've heard the term of unlawful combatants. They, they, they do not have the legal right to wage war because they do not meet the requirements set forth by the various conventions dealing with armed conflict. As a result, every single act that they perpetrate during an armed conflict is illegal even if it is an attack against a military structure, the attack against the coal, therefore, is illegal, and they can be prosecuted for individual acts of murder. <laughs> all right. Um, first of all, I, I don't myself think that Article 5 of the NATO Treaty makes any reference to armed conflict. I think what it says, if I remember it rightly, is armed attack, which is a different concept together. Now, following an armed attack on a state and the military response of that state, you will have an armed conflict. But the question of whether there is an armed conflict that brings the laws of war into play is, to my mind, entirely separate from the question of whether you have an armed attack giving rise to a right to use force by way of self-defense. And I, I don't think it's, it's helpful to confuse the two, nor does the UN Charter require the existence of an armed conflict for there to be a threat to international peace. If you take Resolution 748 on Lockerbie, for example, there's, no, there's never been any suggestion that Libya was involved in an armed conflict with the United States or the United Kingdom, yet its support for international terrorism was rightly castigated in 748 as a threat to international peace and security. Now, I agree that the Al-Qaeda people have no right to wage war, and I have no difficulty whatever with the description of them as unlawful competence. But whether the act of taking part in hostilities when you are an unlawful combatant is a violation of international law or simply a violation of a domestic system of law which international law doesn't interfere with is a question that's been debated to and fro for over a century in connection with the Boer War, uh, dodgy competency in World War I and World War II. There's a huge literature on it with articles by people as eminent as Dick Baxter uh, writing in the British Year of International War. It just seems to me that this unnecessarily complicates matters. And above all, it does offer the opportunity of giving a degree of legitimization to the acts of warfare. And that's something which, in connection with the IRA, the British government rightly set its face against. And I think it would be a mistake for the United States not to set its face against it with Al-Qaeda as well. Scott Sullivan from Duke University. Uh, following up on this point just discussed and for any member of the panel, quite apart from the question 
when a state of armed conflict started, whether it be in 1993 or on September 11th last year. Earlier in the conference, we discussed also the concept of when does the war on terrorism end? It has been suggested by many that as long as there is any terrorist threat from Al Qaeda, that the war on terrorism continues. Does international law then allow the United States to conduct military commissions or to detain indefinitely as long as there is any potential threat against this country? I think you have in the current circumstances not one but two wars. Uh, you have a conflict in Afghanistan uh, in which the primary combatants were the United States on one side and the Taliban on the other, but also to some extent Al-Qaeda personnel seem to have participated. That conflict is not quite over, but it presumably will be over before too long. Uh, and I think it would be difficult with respect to those individuals who primarily were involved in that conflict, for example, your uh, rank-and-file Taliban fighter, who had no connection with the overall Al-Qaeda conflict. It would be difficult to say that uh, the conflict continues for them. Uh, then you have this much broader uh, activity, shall I say, involving uh, Al-Qaeda terrorism against American and other targets. And there is where you have this question of whether it, if it was an armed conflict, is it still an armed conflict? Uh, and if so, how long will it continue? Uh, this is a lot harder to analyze under traditional law of war thinking because it is so unconventional. Normally, one would not assume international terrorist activities constitute armed conflict. The argument here, obviously, is that uh, this is a special case where there was sustained uh, operations by al-Qaeda against the United States which have effectively amounted to that. I have difficulty with the concept of saying that so long as there are al-Qaeda operatives anywhere in the world with bad intentions, that an armed conflict continues with respect to them. Uh, but I think it will be very difficult to define when that conflict, if one accepts it as such, uh, being so inchoate, uh, might actually end in traditional law of war sense. I think as a practical matter, uh, what the United States needs to do is to find appropriate dispositions for all of these people that have been taken into custody. Uh, prosecute them in the United States, find the foreign jurisdiction who will adequately prosecute them. Uh, but I think the idea that we would maintain them in custody indefinitely so long as there is some vestige of a terrorist organization somewhere, is probably too much to sustain as a practical matter. So I think as a practical matter, we need to find out how to dispose of these individuals in an appropriate way. Yes, I'm John Anazi with the Department of the Air Force. Yesterday we spoke of the concept of anticipatory self-defense, and in some ways the investigative prong of what's going on has that element as well. It's not only looking to bring to justice, but it's also looking to be preventative. So I'm wondering in terms of choice of forum, how much do we consider which forums might impose greater evidentiary burdens, uh, and how to overcome some of those to ensure that everyone is fully brought to justice, but that the advanced-looking preventative measures are also able to be performed fully. Well, uh, I think just quickly on that, and we can look at this more globally. I when, when we're dealing with a, a specialized situation, I, I do believe that it is advisable to explore uh, specialized forms for dealing with them. Uh, and basically, that's what some of these tribunals are. Uh, not only for the war crimes, uh, the military commissions that we have, when you look at some of the war crimes tribunals, be it international or, or domestic, the idea beyond the ones that I, I, uh, I stated earlier is also to have a specialized group that can deal with these, these problems. Uh, for example, 
in the former Yugoslavia, some of the domestic efforts that are that are underway, the discussions are creating specialized war crimes chambers between within the uh, the domestic system because they'll have the expertise to, uh, to to deal with these issues. The rules will be drafted accordingly, taking into consideration the complexities of trying some of these cases. In regards to terrorism, we do have to look at it. Uh, the French system, they have a specialized terrorist terrorism uh, uh, court. So therefore, I think looking at the problems, both from preventive and uh, reactive, it is important to, to take into consideration the unusual burdens that the, these events will pose on the system and the, uh, the additional complexities and modify the systems accordingly, while obviously taking into consideration overall fairness in the, uh, in the process. Weisberg. Uh, Mark Weisberg, University of North Carolina Law School. Uh, I have a question um, for the whole panel. Uh, picking up on uh, an observation Mr. Matheson made, uh, we've discussed this morning uh, the question of trial of terrorism pretty much in the context of September 11th. Uh, I would like to, to broaden it just a little to take into account those situations where uh, terrorists or uh, more precisely leaders of terrorist organizations may find themselves uh, eventually, perhaps as a result of the settlement of an internal war, as high government officials. Uh, I know, for example, that uh, this week, negotiations have begun on Sri Lanka uh, between the government and the leader of the Tamil Tigers. Uh, and the reputation of the Tamil Tigers as uh, terrorists, I, I think, needs no elaboration. Uh, that raises in my mind the question of uh, not, not so much the problem of impunity, but uh, particularly given the institution of the International Criminal Court and the necessity for the political judgments as to when international prosecutions are appropriate, to which Mr. Matheson referred, uh, what, is, what is the view of the, uh, of the panel regarding this notion that under no circumstances should terrorists uh, be able to obtain impunity even when the impact of uh, prosecuting a terrorist might be, for example, upsetting uh, some eventual peace settlement in uh, Sri Lanka. Thank you. Well, I won't name names, but uh, I think you probably could identify certain existing heads of state whom you might say had committed uh, terrorism, uh, war crimes, or other heinous uh, acts. In uh, the course of their careers. Um, <laughs> and uh, let, let us be honest, uh, there are some hard decisions that have to be made in cases where there are competing priorities. On the one hand, there is the uh, very strong desire to avoid impunity for such offenses. On the other hand, there may be considerations about uh, achieving a transition to democracy, or ending a war, uh, or preventing a war, which uh, may be equal or of more importance in a particular case. I mean, there's no doubt that when we look at South Africa, that there were offenses committed by the apartheid regime which were unspeakable, and one would normally not wish to have any kind of impunity for them, and yet, uh, I think, uh, generally speaking, people would accept that it was necessary and desirable to have some kind of resolution short of prosecution of all of those offenses in the course of the transition to democracy. These are difficult choices. I don't know how, for example, the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court is supposed to make these difficult choices, uh, but they certainly are ones that have to take into account a wide range of practical, pragmatic, political, as well as principal uh, issues. And there's no avoiding the difficulty of that. So. In the case of the Security Council, it has made those decisions about prosecution or not prosecution in the case of several situations, including Yugoslavia and Rwanda. Uh, 
and it has refrained from imposing international prosecutions in some other situations. Uh, and I think uh, that's a serious question about the whole ICC structure. If I may, just a quick point. Um, I think we, the, the point your question brings out, or actually highlights or underscores, is that you know, there, there is a fine line in the definition, in a sense, between uh, terrorists and, and, and war criminals. You know, we do have your traditional definition of, of terrorists that we all know and have been accustomed to, but what September 11th and, and uh, other events has done, it has required us to revisit these definitions and to really determine what are we dealing with, because so often some of these acts that we're calling terrorist acts are occurring within within a conflict. Uh, you cite Sri Lanka. I mean, that's their, their, the, the, uh, the, the tigers are obviously uh, labeled as terrorists, but it's part of a, of a conflict. Uh, so I, I just want to you know, put that point out there, and I think what, what we really need to do, or, or where we are, is that we are revisiting definitions where you have terrorists that are operating in this, this, this conflict, if you will, and then you may have the, the traditional terrorists that uh, we've been accustomed to over, over the years. Yes, I think there's a world of difference here between uh, terrorism taking place within a state as part of some sort of struggle for power or struggle for secession within a state and terrorism with the Al-Qaeda variety. I can't conceive that the United States is ever going to want to do a deal with Al-Qaeda and sort of share out a few seats in the Senate or anything like that. Um, but the practical fact of the matter is that if you're going to have peace in Sri Lanka and in quite a number of other trouble spots around the world, you're going to have to have the government sitting down and talking to people who brands as terrorists, rightly in most cases, and you're going to have to have some sort of ability to draw a veil over war crimes and other atrocities in the past. Now, that's a very difficult matter, and I think we may come to regret the day when in countries that don't have that problem in their own territory, we nail our colours to a mast of no impunity in any circumstances for crimes under international law. Uh, it, it leaves me rather uneasy. It's a hell of a lot easier to say in the USA or the United Kingdom or Canada or somewhere like that than it is to apply in a place like Sri Lanka or South Africa or for that matter Bosnia, Croatia, Kosovo and a good many others. Well, my name is uh, Lieutenant Colonel Kirby. I've been with the uh, Canadian Forces. And the question for all the panelists concerns uh, the military commission rules. Upon reading them, they don't expressly foreclose the uh, possibility of an accused making an argument or a motion for uh, prisoner of war status entitlement, nor is there anything that expressly forecloses possibilities of a habeas corpus or a constitutional type application to U.S. courts. I was wondering the, about the panelists' thoughts on whether or not the military commission could indeed be a competent tribunal as defined in customary international law. Article 5 of Geneva Convention 3 is interpreted by cases such as Noriega. And additionally, whether or not uh, there is an opportunity to possibly, despite low-level cases to date, for these accused to raise constitutional type or habeas corpus applications. Uh, similar to Yamashita before U.S. courts. Thank you. I guess I'll start this one off. I think uh, as far as other courts asserting jurisdiction or petitioning to other courts, uh, the, the rules need to be read in conjunction with the, the military order. The military order addresses that issue and essentially says that the uh, it has, has uh, the, the primacy, if you will, over all these these matters. But when we get to the commission, the commission will be designed just to deal with the criminal responsibility and not the issues of, of status. Status is separate and apart. Here, what we're doing with the military commission is that's when you move into the criminal under the criminal umbrella. The laws of war umbrella is where you deal with the questions of status and the question of whether or not the uh, the, the conventions apply. Was your question also whether the status question, if put to the commissions, would be engaged? Uh, yes. That's, that's, uh, <coughs> 
don't see that happening. Obviously, I cannot speak for the commissioners, but the the uh, the Article Five hearings there. You know, our view has always been that they are to occur in situations where there is a doubt regarding the status, and we've made the determination not only. Uh, obviously in Guantanamo, but the determination that they made in the field through the various screening processes by by the various uh, commanding officers that uh, the Al-Qaeda, for example, does not uh, uh, get POW status and therefore receive the benefits of, of uh, associated with prison war, such as the pay, going to the canteen, uh, and so on. Yes. Steve Dyke is from Vermont Law School. I have uh, two questions about the November 13th military order. Uh, first, there's, there's evidence in the language of the order that the drafters um, did not intend to confine the jurisdiction of the military commissions to offenses against the law of war. Um, section 4 says, uh, any individual subject to this order shall, when tried, be tried by a military commission for any and all offenses triable by a military commission. So, um, my question is, um, how far do you think the jurisdiction, to, to what extent, uh, what offenses do you think the jurisdiction of the military commissions uh, would extend, and I offer as this example um, the question raised by the ABA Task Force on Military Commissions um, earlier this year, uh, would someone who makes a financial contribution, for example, to Hamas or the IRA be subject to the jurisdiction of the commission, either on the theory that that contribution was a violation of the law of war or for some other reason. And my second question uh, really is a request for uh, an expansion on your answer to Scott Sullivan's question earlier um, relating to the uh, power of detention. Um, recently, Secretary Rumsfeld made the breathtaking assertion that even following a trial and acquittal of an individual by a military commission, the government might elect to continue to retain such a, such a person uh, indefinitely, or at least so long as that person continued to uh, pose a threat to the United States. So a very dangerous person whose release uh, uh, would, uh, would threaten us. Uh, this is a, uh, a serious practical as well as legal issue. I wonder if in addition to the sort of practical concerns that uh, Mike has alluded to, if there's some legal uh, basis for continuing to hold such a person. The, the offenses, actually I won't go into detail because we're in the process of uh, drafting the actual offenses that will be used within the the military commission, but one point that I would make is obviously a commission is competent to try violations of the laws of war, and then there are very varying theories of culpability or responsibilities that can be attached to it, stemming from obviously direct involvement to to conspiracy theories, command responsibility, and things of that nature. Uh, therefore, I think one can can uh, I guess imagine the reach, assuming the, the evidence is there. On the, uh, the question regarding the statement by Secretary Rumsfeld, I think the way to look at it again is that there are two bodies of law that are applicable, the laws of war and, uh, and criminal law. The best example I can give in the hypothetical sense that would make it understandable is that if we were in a, in a war, and this goes back to you know, perception of how you look at the events of September 11th and so on. But if you're in a war with, with Saddam Hussein, for example, Iraq, the Gulf War, if you pick up people, you, you apprehend them, you detain them, and if you realize that they violated the, the laws of war, you could try them. Let's say the conflict is ongoing. You could try the person. The person could be acquitted. 
that the person will continue to be detained under the laws of war because you have a continuing conflict. The laws of war allow you to detain the person during the course of hostilities uh, as long as they continue to pose a threat to, to the forces. So there are two bodies of law that are, that are applicable here. We are in, in, in uh, uncharted waters because we're dealing with an unconventional war that is not what we've always studied in, the, uh, in our textbooks. Well, I think your questions do illustrate some of the ways in which uh, jurisdiction under the uh, federal criminal courts, under U.S. legislation, might be a lot more clear and easier to prosecute in some of these cases than it may be in military commissions. It does obviously depend on how the, the jurisdiction over offenses for the military commissions is defined in the end. But uh, making a financial contribution to Taliban or Al-Qaeda it is clearly a violation of U.S. law. It's in the indictments that have already been quite put forth, and uh, probably are the ones that would be easiest to get convictions on in those cases. Uh, whether that would be a valid element for a military commission, a simple political contribution to an entity, perhaps even before the acts in question, I don't really know. Steve? Smith, I'm a student at Duke Law. Um, in a series of speakers we've had at law school this, this semester, many have addressed adequate redress to the victims of terrorist against ethnic conflict, etc. So um, I'm sure you're aware that part of the criticism of the International Tribunal is for Rwanda and for the ICTY is that it's not giving adequate redress to the victims of the ethnic conflict and those that are there. So in the sphere of terrorism, I was wondering what, you know, you think domestic Panel, uh, domestic courts, the military tribunals, or international courts are the appropriate redress. I say for the international courts because there were international victims in the crimes, domestic courts because the U.S. was here, or military courts, which are partly going to be behind closed doors, may not give adequate redress to the victims. I suddenly realized everybody was looking my way about that. Uh, the answer, I think, is that it, it, you have to look at redress, I think, in two different senses. The first is, if you like, vindication. Seeing a criminal trial of a person who has injured you or killed your husband or wife, whoever it may be. And that, I think, can be done by a proper, effective criminal process, wherever it happens to be. And as I'm sure you'll be aware, it's a long-standing complaint that the criminal process the world over tends to leave the victim somewhat out in the cold. Uh, this is particularly a complaint about sexual offence trials, but I think it can be made about a wide range of offences. The other aspect of redress is in the form of some kind of compensation. Uh, now, as you'll be aware, the ICC, unlike the two ad hoc tribunals, does have the power to make all of the reparations. I think one needs to be a little cautious about this. And the practical reality of the matter is that it is highly unlikely that the majority of defendants are going to have significant resources at their disposal which they, with which they'd be able to meet the board. And if I could just put down a marker for one transatlantic difference, I, I think there is absolutely no point whatever in having federal district courts making awards of $200 million to somebody which is never going to be enforced. That strikes me as the worst of all possible worlds. You get a paper award for a vast sum of money that bears no resemblance whatever to your loss and is a punitive award. And you know you're never going to be able to enforce it. Except, unfortunately, I think in the case of many victims, they don't know they're ever going to be able to enforce it. They go on chasing the, this fantasy of a large pot of money as compensation for something awful that happened to them. It gives rise to what I call bleak house syndrome where you become completely obsessed with a piece of litigation and you can dominate your life. And as a practitioner, I've had far too much experience of people who have become completely warped, in effect, by falling in love with the legal system and wanting to see litigation through forever. And you're great for the lawyers, no good for anybody else at all. Yeah, I agree that uh, court cases are probably not an effective way of providing compensation and redress. Uh, to have an effective program, you have to look to uh, other non-judicial systems 
that have been put together. Uh, perhaps the best one is the one put together by the Security Council after the Gulf War, uh, in which large amounts of uh, Iraqi assets in the form of uh, proceeds from oil exports were put together and uh, given to a commission that has been adjudicating the claims in a systematic way and allocating the resources. You could also look at uh, American claims programs under the Foreign Claims Settlement Commission, uh, where various pots of foreign assets have been made available and again, uh, subject to a comprehensive program of allocating that amongst various claimants. Uh, one of the problems of these court proceedings is that uh, it is the proverbial race in the courtroom in which uh, individual uh, litigants may get judgments, others may not. Uh, there may be relatively little prospect for effective enforcement and recovery, uh, and the, the result is a somewhat haphazard and perhaps inadequate uh, system. Unfortunately, it is not by any means uh, the case that in every situation you will be able to construct the programs like the Iraq uh, claims program. Uh, and I don't know what the situation will be with respect to September 11, whether there will be significant resources available that can be used, but I think the important thing is that such resources as are available should be administered in a comprehensive way to do justice to all victims on an equal basis and not simply reward those who get to the courtroom first with the best attorneys. Thank you. And